Hello everyone, this lecture is going to be covering chapter 2 from your Merob text, which is Chemistry Comes Alive. Um, so this chapter obviously is going to be really heavy on chemistry. Chemistry is a prerequisite for this class, so hopefully you guys have a pretty good general understanding of some of these basic chemical principles. Um, if a lot of this, as you're going through this lecture, is not familiar with you or you're getting confused, um, I definitely would recommend you actually take the time to read through the text and make sure you understand these um, concepts that we're going to cover in this chapter. A lot of this stuff is going to be used throughout this class, especially when we're talking about physiology. So if we're talking about how muscles are contracting, how nerve impulses are transmitted, you're going to need to be able to understand these different um, chemical principles okay so it's really important that you guys understand this stuff and again read the textbook come to office hours if you're confused um but this stuff is definitely important that you know okay so this chapter chemistry obviously your body is made up of many chemicals right that's that's who you are um and chemistry is going to underline all physiological reactions okay so like i said um, if you're looking at movement, how your muscles contract, how food is digested, how your heart is able to pump blood throughout the body, and your nervous system, how nerve tra- impulses are transmitted, so on and so forth. All of those topics, we're going to be really using the chemistry that you're learning in this chapter to explain how the physiological reactions are happening. Okay, So this chapter is going to be split into two parts. The first is just basic chemistry. Um, So that's going to be talking about molecules, ions, different types of solutions. Um, And then the second part is talking about biochemistry. So different types of molecules, specifically looking at proteins, looking at um, uh, fats, uh, looking at polysaccharides and so on. Okay, so because this chapter is kind of long, I'm going to be splitting the lecture into two parts. So this first part, we're just going to be covering basic chemistry. And then the second lecture I'll post will cover the biochemistry. Okay. So let's get started on the basic chemistry. So first of all, matter. What is matter? Matter is anything that has a mass and occupies space. Okay. So matter can be seen, can be smelled or felt. Um, So it it can exist in three different possible states. Okay, so solids have a um, definite shape and volume, right? So if you have a pencil sitting on your desk, that is a solid, right? It has a definite shape, definite volume, um, and that's not going to change unless you either sharpen your pencil, break it up, um, do whatever, right? Liquid, also considered a matter, has a changeable shape, but a definite volume, okay? Which, that should all make sense to you guys already. Liquid, you have a glass full of water. You pour it into a different sized glass. It changes the shape, but the volume's not going to change, right? And then the last um, state matter can exist in is a gas, which you have changeable shape, Um and changeable volume. Okay, so gas, if you um, have a, you know, a cylinder, let's say, of oxygen, you can compress that gas and change the shape of it, and you can also change the volume of the gas. You can compact it or um, compress it to make it um, more pressurized, or you can increase the volume of it so it's not as pressurized, okay? But all three of these are... Um, states that matter can exist in. Okay. Another basic concept you're going to need to know is what energy is. Energy is defined as the capacity to do work or put matter into motion. Okay. Um, so energy does not have a mass or, and it does not take up space. It's just the ability for matter to be able to move, um, to, you know, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so energy can exist in two possible forms. You have kinetic energy, which is the energy in action, and potential energy, which is stored energy. Okay, potential energy is going to be inactive, 
Um, but if an object has potential energy, it has the potential to move. Okay, so some examples of kinetic energy, anything moving. So if you kick a soccer ball, um, that ball rolling, right, is going to have kinetic energy because it's moving. If you're riding a bike, right, riding your bike down a hill, that bike is moving, so it has kinetic energy. Or if you're on a swing, while you're actually swinging, you have kinetic energy, right? Anytime something is moving, it's going to have kinetic energy. Potential energy, like I said, is stored or an active energy. So it's anything that has the potential to move. Okay, so if you go back to the ball rolling example, um, say the ball is like rolling down a hill, right? When it's going down the hill, it has kinetic energy. But if you are at the top of the hill with the ball and it has the potential to roll down that hill, that's going to be some potential energy, right? Or if you're on the swing... <laughs> You're on the swing. Here's a swing, right? When you're in motion, going back and forth, you have kinetic energy. But when the swing is all the way back at the top and it's not moving for a split second, it has potential energy to swing back down, okay? And then when it gets back to the top, again, you're not moving at the very top of your swing, but you have potential energy to move back down, okay? And energy can be transferred between potential and kinetic energy. Obviously, in the swing example, it's a very fluid process, right? You're swinging back, you have kinetic energy. At the top, the kinetic energy is gone, but you have potential energy, and that can be converted back to kinetic energy when you swing back down. Okay, and anytime stored energy is released, you have the action. Okay, so stored potential energy as you swing, that energy is released and you have the action of actual swinging. Okay, there's a few other um, types of energy that we're going to talk about. These you're not going to see quite so much, um, but just to go over them quickly chemical energy is stored in the bonds of chemical substances which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Electrical energy results from the movement of charged particles. Mechanical energy is directly involved in moving matter. And then radiant or electromagnetic energy is going to be traveling in waves. So your UV light spectrum, um, visible light, heat, sound, all of that would be considered radiant energy. Okay, moving in waves. And again, these four aren't quite as important. I mean, you're not going to really see these throughout um, <laughs> the class, but it's important that you have a, just a basic understanding of the different types of energy. Okay, all matter is composed of the elements. Okay, and elements are um, the things that you see on the periodic table. Right, so that you should all hopefully be familiar with. Um, what defines something as an element is if it can't be broken down into smaller parts, okay, by ordinary chemical methods. Nowadays, they have these crazy machines that you can split an atom, whatever, um, but normally, <laughs> um, by normal chemical methods, you can't break elements down into smaller parts. So everything on the periodic table is on the periodic table because it's the smallest possible um, part that is found naturally. Okay, four elements are going to be really important. You're going to see these throughout um, this class. So four elements make up 96% of your body. Okay, so 90% of 96% of you is made up of carbon, which the abbreviation for that is C, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Okay, so those four elements make you you. Um, obviously, 96% isn't the whole. There's still 4% left. So 3.9% is made up of nine elements. And then the last 0.01% is made up of 11 elements. So very small amounts of these other elements. You're mainly made up of the carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Okay. So here is an image of the periodic table, which again, hopefully should be familiar to all of you. And you have all the elements listed out. Um, each element has its own atomic symbol, 
right? Which is just going to be the one or two letter chemical shorthand for the element. So all of these little abbreviations that you see. So for example, oxygen over here um, has the atomic symbol O, okay? Um, C is the atomic symbol for carbon. Um, some elements are, the atomic symbol doesn't necessarily match up with the first letter of the element's name. For example, sodium over here is Na. Um, and that's because that atomic symbol comes from the Latin name um, of sodium, which is na natrium, <laughs> which you don't need to know. But just so you realize, that's where that atomic symbol comes from, the Latin name of sodium. Okay. Elements, which again is what we find on the periodic table, they're going to be made up of atoms. Okay, so atoms are the smallest particles of an element with properties of that element, which is kind of a confusing definition. Um, but atoms are what's giving each element its particular and particular physical and chemical properties. Okay, so atoms are composed of three subatomic particles. So three things make up an atom. You have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so these three subatomic particles make up an atom. Atoms make up elements. Okay, so protons um, are going to be positively charged. Okay, and they have a mass to them because they're, you know, um, matter. And they weigh one atomic mass unit. Okay. Neutrons have no electrical charge, so they're just neutral is how I remember it. And they also weigh one atomic mass unit. Electrons have a negative charge. And electrons are so small that they don't have any weight to them at all. Okay. So those are the three subatomic particles, and I'm expecting you guys to know um, which ones are positive, neutral, negative, and what each of them weighs. So again, protons have a positive charge and weigh one AMU. That's not a U, Claire. <laughs> one AMU. Neutrons don't have a charge at all, um, but they weigh one AMU. And electrons are negatively charged. Okay. Hopefully, it's review for you guys. When we're looking at elements, um, well, actually, first, the number of positive protons is always going to be balanced by the number of negative electrons. Okay, so atoms are elect electrically neutral at rest, okay, when they're by their own. Positive protons, negative electrons, the number of each are going to equal out. So in this image here, in the nucleus, you have your protons and neutrons. So protons and neutrons are found in, in the nucleus. Electrons are around the nucleus, okay? So in this image here, again, the red is gonna be the protons, yellow is the neutrons, and then the electrons are around the outside. So if you have two positive protons in the nucleus, you're also going to have two negative electrons orbiting around the nucleus. Okay, and again, um, this is so that there is no net charge of the atom. Okay, so in its natural state, atoms are not going to be positive nor negative. Okay, and there's these two different ways we can depict um, atoms. The orbital model just shows the electrons as like a cloud around the nucleus. Um, this uh, model on the right, the planetary model, actually shows the electrons. Um, we're not really going to get too far into which model is better because it doesn't really matter for our anatomy and physiology class. Okay. Different elements contain different amounts of these subatomic particles, okay? And that's what's going to make each element different, okay? They're different elements because their atoms that they're made up of have different um, concentrations of these particles. So, for example, hydrogen has one proton, zero neutrons, and one electron, 
Okay, mm-hmm. so again, number of protons is always going to equal the number of electrons because we have a positive proton, a negative electron, and we want to cancel those out. So hydrogen only has one proton. Helium has two protons, has two neutrons, and two electrons. Again, two positive charges, two negative charges, so it's going to cancel those out. It's going to be not have an electrical charge. Lithium has three protons in the nucleus, right? Four neutrons. And then because it has three protons, it's also going to have three electrons. Okay, so again, the charges are all going to cancel out. Okay, so the different concentrations and different um, number of protons, neutrons, and electrons are what's going to make each element different and give it some different properties. Okay. We can um, name these different numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons um, and give them defining characteristics, the elements. Um, So a lot of times you'll see an element given an atomic number, which is the number that's shown on the periodic table. And the atomic number is just the number of protons that an element has. Okay, So atomic number is the number of protons. It's really important that you remember that. Okay, and each element is going to have a different number of protons. Okay, so no matter what you have on the periodic table, let me show you, right? These um, atomic numbers on the periodic table, right? These numbers is what's telling you how many protons each element has. And you'll see we have one, two, three, four, we have five, six, seven, right? So there's an element with every possible number of protons. And that's what's going to be the distinguishing factor between all of the elements, okay? So on the periodic table, the atomic number is going to be listed up at the top like I just showed you. But there's another way to um, denote these elements and their numbers. And if you see the element written and the um, a number written as a subscript to the left of it, that's going to be the atomic number, okay? So the atomic number, again, is just the number of protons. We also have something known as the mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons, okay? Which makes sense because we said in the last slide, proteins have a mass of one, proteins, protons have a mass of one atomic mass unit, and neutrons also have one atomic mass unit, okay? So those two together give you the mass number of that element, okay? Um, We don't include electrons in the mass number because remember, they have a negative charge, but they don't have any weight, Okay, so we are not (laughs) going to include electrons in the atomic mass, uh, the mass number, excuse me. Okay, and when you have this shorthand notion, um, the mass number is going to be written as a superscript to the left of the atomic symbol. Okay, so down here on the right, you see we have an element. Up top is the um, mass number right, which is the number of protons and neutrons, and the bottom left is the atomic number, okay, which is just the number of protons, okay, so let's say for it, for this example really quick, if we want to find out how many um, neutrons, how many neutrons are in this element, in this box in the bottom right, Okay, so our mass number is protons and neutrons, which in this case was 7. Our atomic number is just the number of protons, which in this case is 3. So if we take the mass number minus the atomic number, it's going to give you the number of neutrons. Does that make sense? Because mass number is protons and neutrons. Atomic number is just protons. So if you um, subtract those two, it'll give you the number of neutrons. Okay? 
So I don't know why this periodic table is there. Okay, there's a few other terms we're going to have to know. Um, the first is isotope. Okay, isotopes are structural variations of the same element. Okay, so atoms are always going to, always, 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 always going to have the same number of protons, right? Because that's what gives you the atomic number. So um, lithium, I think is what that is, is always going to have the same number of protons. The atomic number is always going to be three, okay, no matter what. But they can have different number of neutrons. Okay, so these elements, when found naturally, there are different isotopes of them. So um, some of the lithium molecules may have the four neutrons, but you could have um, some lithium molecules that naturally have five neutrons. Okay, so the atomic numbers are always going to be the same. But you can have isotopes where the mass numbers are different, okay? Because you'll have a set, again, set number of protons, but you can have a few different variations of the number of neutrons, okay? And again, remember, mass number is number of protons plus the number of neutrons, okay? Um, and then the last term we're going to have to know is the atomic weight or the atomic mass, um, and we talked before about this mass number, right? In this example, it was seven. That is the mass of that specific isotope, okay? Because this isotope has three, neutron, three protons, it has four neutrons, so the mass number is seven. But we can have lithium naturally occurring that has different number of neutrons, so it's gonna have a different mass number. Okay, the atomic weight and the atomic mass um, is the average mass numbers of all isotope of a single atom. Okay, so the atomic weight or atomic mass is the number that you're going to see on the periodic table. Okay, so if we go back, all of these numbers on the periodic table, so for example, carbon, 12.011 is the atomic mass. Oxygen, 15.999 is the atomic mass. They're not nice round numbers because you have some oxygen molecules that have more neutrons, so they're going to be a little bit heavier, or some that have less neutrons, so they're going to be a little bit lighter. Okay, so let's look at oxygen again really quick here. Oxygen's atomic number is eight. So we know we have eight protons. The atomic mass here of oxygen is 15.99, okay? So I'm just going to round that to 16 is the um, atomic mass. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, that's about the average. So what's the average number of neutrons in an oxygen molecule. So you should know the atomic mass is protons plus neutrons. Okay, so if we take 16 minus 8, the average molecule of oxygen is going to have 8 neutrons. Okay? But there are going to be different isotopes, which is why that number is not a nice round number. So for example, here's a, a nice picture that shows it. Hydrogen, um, the atomic number is one because it's always going to have one proton. No matter what, hydrogen, atomic number one, always has um, one proton. Okay. We can have, though, isotopes of hydrogen that have different numbers of neutrons. So again, isotopes is when you have different numbers of neutrons. So um, this first one has no neutrons. The second one, you have a single neutron. And the third one, you have two neutrons. Okay, so what's the uh, mass number for all of these? The first one, remember the mass number is protons plus neutrons. So the mass number for this first one is pretty easy. It's going to be 1. 
the mass number for the second one is going to be 2, and the mass number for this third one is going to be 3, right? The total number of subatomic particles in the nucleus, okay? Let's quickly look at, it's a little blurry, but the atomic mass listed for hydrogen on the periodic table, and it's 1.008, that atomic mass, remember, is the average of all of the different isotopes of hydrogen um, that you can have naturally occurring. 1.008 is very close to 1, so it tells me that this first isotope is going to be the most common isotope, okay? Because the mass number 1 is really close to the average of all the naturally occurring isotopes. If this third one was the most common this mass number would be closer to three. Does that make sense? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. So let's move on and do kind of an example here. So if you want to pause it and try to go through and fill this out on your own, that might be a good practice. You should be able to do this now. Okay, so the element here listed we have is carbon. The number six on the bottom is the same for all of these, so that should tell you right now that is going to be the atomic number. And remember, the atomic number is the number of protons, which is never going to change. The numbers 12, 13, and 14 refer to the mass number. Okay, and again, remember, these are all different isotopes, so they're going to have different mass numbers, and that equals number of protons plus number of neutrons. Okay, so for this first isotope, how many protons and neutrons? So we should, I'm just going to write it over here, know there's six protons because we have um, the atomic number of six. How many neutrons? Well, we take this top number, the mass number, minus 6, 12 minus 6. We have 6 protons and 6 neutrons. Okay, the second one, again, atomic number is 6. But this time the mass number is 13. So 13 minus 6. We have 6 protons, but we have 7 neutrons. And then this last one, again, 6 protons, but the mass number is 14, so we're going to have 8 <laughs> neutrons, right? I have another question for you. How many electrons are going to be in these isotopes? You should be able to answer that. So we know there's 6 protons in each of them. Remember, the number of electrons is always going to equal the number of protons. So we have, um, I don't know what number, but there's six electrons in all of them because we have six positive charges. So we want six negative charges to cancel that out. Okay? So that's elements. Again, elements are made of atoms. Atoms are made of those subatomic particles. Um, atoms naturally chemically combine with other atoms. Um, to form molecules and compounds. Okay, so a molecule is just a general term. It's used kind of interchangeably for a lot of things, um, but it's just two or more atoms bonded together. Um, so molecules with only one type of atom, they're just called molecules. But compounds are specific types of molecules that have two or more different kinds of atoms. Okay, so if you just have two hydrogens or two oxygens together, that's considered a molecule. But if you have different elements bonded together, so carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, at that point it's considered a compound, which is a type of molecule, uh, but more specifically we can call it a compound. Okay. Most matter exists as mixtures, um, which is, means there's one or two, two or more um, components that are intermixed. 
Okay, and there's three different types. I have a slide for all of these. Um, but we have what are called solutions. We have colloids. And we have suspensions. Okay. I'll just go through the slides to explain them. So solutions are homogeneous mixtures, which means the particles are going to be evenly distributed throughout the mixture. Okay, so um, in a solution, you're going to have a solvent and a solute, at least one solute. The solvent is the substance that's present in the greatest amount. So it's usually going to be the liquid, such as water. So it's going to be what's doing the dissolving, is what I like to think of it. The solute is the substance that's going to be dissolved. Okay, so it's always going to be present in smaller amounts. So for example, if you're trying to make hummingbird food, you're making a solution, right? Because you have a homogeneous mixture of sugar and water, right? All of the water has equal amounts of sugar in it if you dissolve it correctly. So your solvent and solute... What would be your solvent in hummingbird food? If it's a liquid, it's going to be your water, right? And the solute then is going to be the sugar that you add to the water. And again, hummingbird food is an example of this because it's homogeneous, which means your sugar equally distributes throughout the water, okay? True solutions are usually transparent. Um, so they're going to be pretty clear. Salt water, sugar water, think of all those. You can see right through them. Um, also, I'm just going to, public service announcement, don't put red food coloring in your hummingbird food. It's not good for the hummingbirds. Just keep it sugar and water. Okay. Um, it, with solutions, we can express um, concentrations three different ways. And you're going to talk a lot more about this in lab, but I want to quickly go over it in here. Um, so you can talk about it in percentage of total solute in the solution. So say you have, oh, there's an example here. How many parts of solute are in 100 parts of the solution? Um, so 10 parts salt, 90 parts water. You have a 10% salt solution. Okay, if you have 20 parts salts, to 80 parts water, you'd have a 20% salt solution. The second way we can look at milligrams per deciliter, which we're not really going to um, look at too closely in this class, um, but it's just fasting blood glucose levels around 80 milligrams a deciliter. So how much um, of the of the solute in milligrams per deciliter of water. And then the third way um, is molarity, which you're going to be looking at a lot more in lab. Um, molarity deals with moles. Okay, Molarity is the number of moles per liter of water or liter of solvent. Okay, and the equation for moles, a mole is grams per atomic mass unit. Okay. Um, so if we have, um, let's say right here, we have a glucose, C6H12O6, has the atomic mass units of 180. So if you want to figure out how much one mole of this glucose weighs, if you have 180, I'm just going to round up, down, atomic mass units, get this out of the denominator, 1 times 180, 180 grams, okay, so that's just a way to show it, um, but a mole of a compound is going to be equal to its molecular weight in grams, okay, so a mole of glucose equals 180.12 grams, okay? So we can use moles to calculate molarity. Um, molarity, again, is moles per liter, moles per liter of solvent. Um, so f say for this example, we want to make 
a one molar solution of glucose. One molar solution of glucose. We know a mole weighs um, 180 grams. I'm just going to round. If we go back here, molarity is moles per liter. So we know we need 180 grams to make a liter of the solution. Okay. In lab, you're going to be um, talking about this quite a bit, and Zach's going to go through and do a lot of examples. So I'm not going to worry about it too much in lecture here. Um, next week, we'll be talking about this a little bit more. I also posted a video of me in a previous semester going through um, and doing a whole bunch of calculations with this. So if you need extra help after you get the um, class time with Zach, watch that video and it'll explain, give you five million examples of how to do this calculations to find molarity. Okay. Um, a mole of any substance contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. And that's known as Avogadro's number. So Avogadro is just a guy. Remember, a mole equals grams per atomic mass unit. So to relate grams and atomic mass, atomic mass, again, the mass of our protons and neutrons, to get that into something we can actually measure, um, Avogadro is a guy that came up with this number, which gives us a ratio, a way to relate those two things. Okay, so you should know Avogadro's number is just 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power. Okay, um, and molarities, again, we've been talking about just um, molarity. It's a big M, a mol molarity, but we have concentrations that are small, so you might see um, them noted in millimolar, and there's a thousand millimolars per one mole. Okay, and again, you're going to get a lot of practice with this in the lab, so I'm going to kind of skim over it. Okay, so that would be our solutions. We also have colloids, our second. Um, these are known as emulsions. Instead of being homogeneous, um, they're heterogeneous, which means particles are not evenly distributed through the mixture. Okay. Um, and because particles aren't evenly distributed, it's going to give the mixture a cloudy look, cloudy or milky. Um, some undergo this sol gel transformation. Um, so an example, jello is an example of a colloid, right? It's a little bit cloudy, milky. Um, the particles in the mixture aren't evenly distributed, so it's uh, heterogeneous. And it's a little gel type solution. So anytime you see a gel, um, it's going to normally be a colloid. Okay, the cytosol in your cell is also an example of that. And the last type of mixture is the suspension. It is also considered a heterogeneous because you don't have even distribution of your molecules. But unlike a colloid, suspensions can settle out. So an example of this is a mixture of water and sand. So unlike salt water, you leave salt water there forever, salt's not going to settle out. Sand water, eventually the sand's going to settle out of the solution. Okay. Um, blood is a really good example of a suspension because if you left blood in a tube, blood cells will settle to the bottom. Also, if you put blood in a centrifuge, you'll get... Um, separation of your blood cells from the blood plasma. Okay, there's three main difference between mixtures, what we just talked about, and compounds, which we're about to talk about. So mixtures do not involve chemical bonding between your components. So um, blood in plasma, your suspension, Obviously, there's no bonding between the blood and the plasma. Salt water, the salt's just dissolved in the water. Jello, there's no chemical bonding going on. Mixtures can all be separated by some sort of physical mean. Um, so in suspensions, they'll naturally settle out, like the sand, water, or blood. But colloids and um, solutions, the, um, 
the solutes can always be separated. So salt water, you can separate the salt and water by some sort of physical mean. Um, you don't have to break any chemical bonds to separate mixtures. Mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Okay, remember homogeneous was only for solutions. Colloids and suspensions were heterogeneous. Compounds are only going to be homogeneous. Okay. So again, what makes compounds different is that they have chemical bonds. Chemical bonds are energy relationships between electrons of reacting atoms. Okay, so the electrons, the negatively charged particles of atoms can react with each other and those create bonds between atoms. Okay, so again, it's really important that you know electrons are what's going to be doing the bonding of chemical reactions. Okay, and depending on the amount of electrons, the type of atom that we're looking at, there's different types of bonds that can be made. Okay. Electrons occupy areas around the nucleus called your electron shell. So we kind of saw it before um, in some drawings, but you have your protons and neutrons in your nucleus, and then you have rings or electron shells around that contain your electrons. Okay, and there's different levels of these rings, different, we call them shells. So the first shell closest to the nucleus can only hold two electrons. The next shell can hold eight. <laughs> and then the third shell can hold 18 electrons. So depending on how many protons, remember number of protons equals the number of electrons, the number of of protons an atom has will determine the number of electrons an atom has. So the larger molecules will have more electrons, so they're going to need more shells to hold all of them. Okay, The outermost shell um, is called the valence shell. Okay, So um, for example, oxygen, well, let's say carbon. Carbon Atomic number is six. So you have six protons, so you have six electrons, right? So you're going to have the nucleus, and you have one, two in the first shell, three, four, five, six electrons total. So your outer shell is only going to hold four. The outermost shell is going to be your valence shell. Okay, and the valence shell is important because. Um, the electrons in the valence shell have the most potential energy and they are going to be the electrons that are involved in chemical reactions. So only electrons in the valence shell, the outermost shell, are going to be involved in any sort of chemical reaction. Okay, Atoms like to have full shells and this is known as the octet rule. So that second shell has um, eight spots. Right? So it wants that outer shell to be full. If you have a smaller atom, such as um, helium, hydrogen, um, it only wants two electrons in the outer shell. Whatever the valence shell is, the uh, molecule, the atom, is going to want it to be full. Okay, And this desire to have the valence shell to be full is what's going to be driving chemical reactions. Okay, If you already have a full valence shell, um, those elements aren't going to be very reactive. They're not going to want to bind to other elements um, because they're already stable and happy as they are. And those are going to call the noble gases. Okay, Most atoms, though, do not have full valence shells Okay, because they don't have the perfect eight or two. Um, so these atoms are going to want to gain, lose, or share electrons. That so that they can achieve that stability of eight electrons. Okay, and this is what is what forming bonds is. Okay, so this here's an example of um, some atoms. We have helium, 
right, which has two electrons in the outer shell. And in this case, this is stable because the first shell, again, only holds two. Neon, um, we have 10 electrons total. So two in the first shell and then eight in the outer shell. So this is also stable because, again, that outer valence shell has the full eight. If we don't have a full shell, then you're gonna end up with chemically reactive or unstable elements that are gonna to wanna to bond. So hydrogen only has one electron, so it's really gonna to want to get another electron, share an electron with another molecule so they can get a stable shell. Oxygen, the same thing, you only have six electrons in your valence shell, so it's gonna to wanna to get two more electrons somehow so it can be more stable. Okay? And this is what forming bonds is all about, is getting that outer valence shell full of electrons. There's three major bonds that we're going to see. Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Okay, So I'm going to go through all of these in detail. Ionic bonds are formed by um, ions that gain or lost electrons. So if an atom, excuse me, gains or loses electrons, it forms an ionic bond. Okay? And again, in this case, if you're gaining or losing electrons, the number of protons is not going to equal the number of electrons. Okay? So remember I I've, I've said this before, normally protons equals electrons cuz protons are positive, electrons are negative. You want to have them equal. But in cases you have ionic bonds happening, if you gain or lose electrons, you're not going to have equal numbers anymore. Okay? So ionic bonds involve the transfer of valence shell electrons. Okay? This is going to form what we call ions. Okay? So if an atom gains or loses electrons negatively charged it becomes an ion okay there's two different types of ions we can have anion and cation if you gain electrons you become an anion if you lose electrons you become a cation okay and it gets a little bit confusing because if you gain electrons you become more negative, right? Because electrons are negatively charged. If you have a negative charge, you're an anion. If you lose electrons, you lose a negative charge, you become more positively charged, right? Because you're losing the negative charge. So now you have more protons in the nucleus than you do have, um, you have electrons. So you're going to be positively charged. Okay, so cations are positively charged. Anions are negatively charged. Negative charge is gaining electrons. Positive charge are losing electrons. And I remember I really like cats. <laughs> cat, cat ion. So I think cats are positive. I like cats a lot. So cat ions are positive. Okay. So this is showing um, uh, uh, ionic bond here. So we have a sodium atom that has only one electron in its outer shell and a chlorine that has seven electrons in its outer shell. So chlorine really wants to gain an electron. Sodium wants to get rid of its one electron so that it has a full valence shell, which would be this next shell. Okay, so the sodium is going to give its electron to chlorine, so chlorine has a full shell, and sodium has a full shell. So if sodium loses an electron, it's going to become more positive, right? Chlorine is going to gain an electron. It's going to become more negative. Okay, so after this bond happens, you end up with two ions, okay? You start with an atom. But if you gain or lose an electron, you become an ion. So sodium loses an electron, so it's going to become a positive cation. Chlorine 
gains an electron, so it's going to become a negative anion. Okay? And that is an ionic bond. Transferring electrons. Normally, this is going to happen in salts. So, sodium chloride and ACL, what we just saw, is an example of a salt. It's table salt. Um, and it's going to be held together with ionic bonds. Again, because um, sodium wants to give its extra electron to the chlorine molecule. So that's ionic bonds. Next, we have covalent bonds, which instead of transferring electrons, the atoms are going to share electrons. Okay, They can share two electrons to form a single bond, four electrons for a double bond, or six electrons for a triple bond. Okay, This allows the atoms to fill their valence shells at least part of the time. So when they share electrons, you're not giving up your electron. You're just getting closer to another atom and kind of bouncing your electrons back and forth so you can kind of feel like your valence shell is full, even though it's technically not. Okay, so down here we have two oxygen atoms. They have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in each of their valence shells. So they each want to gain two electrons. Okay, so two oxygen atoms are going to come together and share two of their electrons to form a double bond. Okay, because you share, each one shares two, so four electrons total are shared. So now, I just colored over it, but now each oxygen has this normal six, but also is sharing two from the other one, so it has eight electrons, kind of and is happy that his shell is full. Okay, covalent bonds can be either polar or nonpolar. Um, so here's some more examples. So we have carbon that has four electrons in its outer shell. It wants eight total. So it's going to find these hydrogens, which have one electron, and they want two right in their outer shell to be full, so they're gonna get together. So now carbon is going to be with four hydrogens. So each one, this hydrogen now has two electrons associated with it. This one's gonna have two, two, and two, and the carbon is gonna have eight electrons total. It's gonna be happy. Okay, so they're just sharing electrons. So you would have carbon with these four hydrogens as a single um, molecule. And this is what methane gases in this example. Okay? So now back to polar and nonpolar. Nonpolar means we have equal sharing of electrons. Okay? So we have an electrically balanced nonpolar molecule. So for example, carbon dioxide. Those examples that we just looked at, you have equal sharing, a double bond between your carbon and your oxygens. Okay? Completely linear and symmetric, symmetrical. Okay, that's nonpolar. However, in some cases, we're going to have unequal sharing. And that results in a polar bond. Okay? Um, so this is due to the um, electronegativity of molecules, which we're not going to talk about too much. Um but some molecules have more electron attack attracting ability is what it says here, okay? Some atoms, okay? Um, oxygen, for example, is more electronegative, so it's going to exert a greater pull on the electrons, okay? And electronegativity is just a, um, a you know, a a naturally occurring thing that these atoms have. Some happen to be more electronegative than others. Okay, this is an, an advanced chemistry class. So we're not really going to talk about what determines that. Um, but some molecules are more electronegative. So the electrons are naturally going to want to go to that molecule. Okay, so if oxygen is pulling the electrons more than the hydrogen molecules are, right, because they're forming this bond, it's going to result in a polar molecule. 
okay? And this is uh, referred to as a dipole. And I think it makes more sense if you look at the picture here. Um, so oxygen, again, is more electronegative, and these hydrogens are less electronegative. Okay, oxygen has six, molecule, six electrons in its valence shell. Remember, hydrogens only have one. So they want to form bonds so that they're sharing these electrons. Okay, so what you end up with is you have these two closest to the line are going to be shared, but they're going to be closer to the oxygen since oxygen is more electronegative, okay, which is going to result in a partially negative charge on the oxygen side and a partially positive charge on the hydrogen side, which makes this molecule polar. You have one side more negative, one side more positive. Because most of the electrons are going to be over here. Most of the um, not electrons, you have just prote protons over here. So you're going to have more positive charge. Does that make sense? So again, this is called a dipole. Where you have a separation of charge. Okay. So here's just kind of a review. Ionic bonds is the complete transfer you end up with different ions that either have a positive or a negative charge. Nonpolar covalent bonds, you have equal sharing, which is forming just a nice balanced molecule. Polar covalent bonds are kind of in the middle. You have sharing of electrons still, but it's unequal. So it's kind of similar to an ionic bond where you end up with these charges, but they're not full charges. They're either partially negative or partially positive. Okay. This is just another overview of this. Tables in your book. I'd recommend you take a look at that. And then the last type of bond we're going to talk about is hydrogen bonds, which is just an attractive force between electropositive hydrogen of one molecule an electronegative atom of an, another molecule. So it's just very common in dipoles that we talked about, which remember are due to polar covalent bonds. So for this example, remember we have H2O water is a polar covalent bond. Our oxygen is more electronegative, so the electrons go towards that. So we have a negative charge there, partial, when <laughs> our hydrogen molecule atoms then have a, a partially positive charge. The negative charge of the oxygen is going to be attracted to the partial positive charge of the neighboring hydrogen. Okay, And this is what makes water liquid. These partial charges are going to end up creating small bonds between um, similar molecules. It's kind of cool. And that's what creates surface tension and lets these little water striders walk out on the water. Okay. Um, and then the last part of this chapter, this first part of the chapter, excuse me, chemical reactions um, occur when chemical bonds are formed, rearranged, or broken. They're denoted on, in chemical equations where you have reactants on one side and products on the other side. So if you have A plus B equals AB, very basic, right? So any sort of reaction, chemical reaction, you're going to have reactants that form products, okay? And these products are formed by the bonds we just talked about, okay? Okay. And at the end, what you get these products, they're re represented by these molecular formulas. And this is just pretty basic, just um, some terms you need to know. With the reactants, you'll see that you're going to have prefixes. So 4H tells you how many unjoined atoms you have. So in this case, you have four hydrogens, one carbon. Subscripts at the end here, CH4, now that the number is a subscript, it tells you that these molecules, atoms, have now been joined 
by bonds. So instead of four hydrogen molecules just floating around, now they're bonded to your carbon. Okay, and you should be able to tell me that that is a um, covalent bond because they're sharing the electrons. Okay. Chemical reactions can be affected by a few different things. Temperature can increase the rate of a chemical reaction. Concentration of reactants. If you have more concentration, more reactants, it can re increase the rate of the reaction. And particle size. Typically, smaller particles um, can react more quickly. There are things known as catalysts that can also increase the rate of reaction, um, such as enzymes, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on in this chapter. Okay, so that's it for part one of chapter two. Um, there will be another video going over the second part of the chapter, which covers biochemistry.